Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Eye of the Storm Astrology. Today I'm going to be looking into a very interesting chart and that is going to be the chart of presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. So that's what's coming up next. Okay, so today we're diving into the birth chart of Vivek Ramaswamy, um, Republican presidential candidate. Now, regardless of your opinion of him, what you think of him or anything like that, everyone has to admit he is a very interesting character and has definitely been making some waves in the media and things like that. So I wanted to go ahead and look at his birth chart because I, I was curious. And then as I looked at it, I, I found it to be a very interesting birth chart. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into that. So first off, I want to take a note that he is a Sagittarius Lagna, so Sagittarius Ascendant, and the Nakshatra that it falls into is Purva Ashada, so Purva Ashada Lagna. He also has Neptune sitting in Mula Nakshatra here as well in his first house. So what can we see from this? Well, obviously Sagittarius is a sign that is symbolized by the archer. So it's always focused on a goal, focused on a target. They like being very accurate. It's a fire sign, so that it has a fiery nature to it. It's ruled by the planet Jupiter, and it is the external or the masculine expression of Jupiter. So the qualities that Jupiter, Jupiter has, being a guru, a teacher, uh, wisdom, education, uh, financial abundance, fatherhood, all of these different themes, you'll see also come out and be expressed in Sagittarius. And if you actually look at a lot of the things uh, Vivek is talking about as he goes through his campaign, his goals, the values he's speaking on, very much you can see that Jupiterian nature coming through, which when we do look at his Jupiter, we'll see that it's it's retrograde, which is one reason why he likes to criticize um, the establishment, the powers that be the government, because it's also, it's also sitting in Capricorn, which is a sign of government. So you know, but we'll look at that further in depth later. Now, Purva Shada Nakshatra, this is a nakshatra that is very strategic. It is a nakshatra that it kind of works as a pair. So there's different sets of nakshatras that they'll, they'll be two of them. There'll be a Purva and a Uttara. Purva means the earlier and Uttara is the later. Purva Shada is a nakshatra that it's like an army that is moving into battle. In fact, the, the, uh, Purva Shada and Uttara Tara and Nakshatras, they were the ones that they used to try to time their wars, these different types of things, for being under the, the influence of these Nakshatras, of these stars. In fact, the presidential inauguration in early January is always when the sun is in Uttara Ashada. Uttara Ashada is all about the final victory. So there, you know, there's not that's not by accident so purva shada is like that army moving moving towards the battle so it that's when the strategy is being applied they're strategically moving themselves into position they know a fight is getting ready to come and it's all about setting themselves up for that fight so purva shada very much will have this energy and if you look at vivek's campaign he, he's been extremely strategic um, you can definitely tell he has experience in the business world. And for those who may not be familiar, he's successfully started a biotech company. So in the financial world, he's also went to law school as well. Um, so he's done multiple things in different fields and been successful in all of them. So he's a very, very interesting character in that sense and kind of pulls experience from and his knowledge of the world from each of those different fields and backgrounds and kind of brings them all together. And this is another thing that Purva Shada does. It's the deity that actually is associated with Purva Shada as the goddess Apis of the river. When you, when you think about a river, how it works is it, it gathers more water from different tributaries, different little streams and brooks and stuff like that. And they, they get larger and larger and larger and eventually becomes a flowing river and then it works its way all the way through down to the sea. So that's something that you can see. And even with uh, Vivek's media strategy here, what is it? He's, you know, more than any other candidate, he's willing to go talk to anybody, for, you know, anybody at all. He's unafraid to give an unscripted interview, doesn't have to be prepared. We'll do it on the fly. So by doing that, 
he's drawing attention to himself from all these different sources. It's like diff all these little media outlets that he's willing to go out and speak to. These are all like little tributaries of attention that eventually flow into the river that we're seeing kind of uh, grow into the movement um, that Vivek's really building. Um, and that that's filming as of it's January 4th right now. The Iowa caucus is going to come up on January 15th. And I think there, there'll be some very interesting results from that. And I can astrologically, I can get to some reasons, but just without even astrological things, you, you could politically, you could see that kind of happening as well. But just to focus on the chart, we can we can see that. So that's something in a strategy of, of pulling a lot of different resources together to eventually build those into a powerful force. We can also see that rivers, whenever they navigate the landscape, they you could say they do so strategically. They they meander around the landscape. They fit where they need to go in order to be able to get to get to their goal. And Purvashada very much is like this, that it doesn't have to necessarily move in a completely direct line. It can be very strategic. You can see that, oh, by taking this path here, this will help me get to this position. And then from here, it's easier to move to this position. And, you know, it, it, it's a very, very strategic nakshakra. That is probably one of the, the main words I would associate with the qualities of it. Now, when we also look here in his first house at Neptune um, in Mula Nakshatra, I really want to focus on the, the energy of Mula Nakshatra because it's symbolized by the tangled roots. So it is all about getting to the, the root of things, getting to the truth. It wants to untangle lies. It wants to destroy things. The deity associated with this is one of the Rudrani, uh, which are the, the female versions of Rudra or, or Shiva. So this is the feminine aspect of the destructive energy. Uh, Mahakali is also associated with this nakshatra. So when you, when you look at that, you can see that that type of energy is there, that there is a, a want to be destructive. Now, destruction is not always a bad thing. In fact, we cannot exist without destruction. But if you look at what he's wanting to go after, it's system, uh, the system, lies, corruption, um, all of these different things that are going on, it's getting to the root of them and then trying to destroy those. One, like Mula likes to use lies to destroy other lies. So people with Mula, you'll see them when they're questioning others and stuff like this. And you'll see this whenever he does interviews with reporters. He'll highlight two different things they're doing that both can't be true at the same time. Therefore, that lie destroys the other lie. So you use their own words against them. You know, that that type of a thing, that is very much an energy that you see with Mula Nakshatra. So we can we can see that there is a, when you look at Purvashada and Mula together in the first house like this, it's really going to show that there is a strategy behind the destruction. And that's very much something we can see in his campaign from very early on. He's, you know, said, you know, one of his main things is he wants to cut the federal bureaucracy by 75 percent, um, 50 percent beginning the first day. You know, get rid of the alphabet agencies like the FBI, um, the ATF, et cetera, et cetera. Th there is an, an element of destruction in the strategy, but it's not destruction just for the sake of destruction. It's a strategic destruction. So that's something that's very interesting to note. So we very much can see why this is such a big theme in his campaign, because this is what is going on in his first house. Now, the next thing I want to look at is this Venus in the seventh house, and it is in the sign of Gemini, and it is in the nakshatra of Ardra. Now, Ardra nakshatra is a very interesting one because it's symbolized by a, a teardrop. And it is, it's all about a destructive storm. This is the nakshatra where Lord Shiva resides. Ardra and Mula are also uh, across from each other. So they they are nakshatras that are reflections of each other. So it's very interesting that he has both of these um, in his chart. And not just that, but in the first house and the seventh house. So in his house of self and in his house of relationship. So obviously that's going to reflect very strongly into his life and the things that, that he does. But the thing that we have to understand about Ardra is... While it's a destructive storm, 
Again, it's not destruction just for the sake of destruction. It's destruction with a purpose. To really understand Arja, we also want to understand the Nakshatra that follows it, which is Punar Vasu. And Punar Vasu means uh, essentially to like to come again and again. It is like whenever a storm comes through, that's Arja, right? The sun that shines afterwards, the clean air, that refreshed, clean feeling that is in the air, uh, all the plants are watered, the birds are singing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's Punar Vasu. But you don't get to that cleansing that refreshing feeling until you go through the storm in the first place so when we see venus in ardra here it is one that very much wants to interact with other people especially it's going you know you have a planet like venus which is very friendly and in a sign like gemini which is a very friendly sign is wants to interact with people but wants to wants to create storms, wants to shake things up, wants to get to the root of things, uh, wants to cleanse out whatever dirty air is there, so to speak. It, you know, just wants to come in, do its destructive thing. But because that destruction happened, there there's a cleanliness that comes through. So it's very much, it, Ardra is very much an Akshatra that is about purification, refinement these these type of things so that is something that is is very interesting to note here in this chart another really interesting one here and i'm going to hit quickly on the planets that um are just sitting by themselves very quickly and then we'll get into these these heavy conjunctions because he's got a couple of good big conjunctions here the next one i want to look at is his moon so for those who may not be familiar, moon represents our mind and our emotions. It's the way that we experience our karmas, the way that we experience our, our world. That's why two people can go through the same experience and, and have different interpretations of that. Okay. So his moon is sitting in the sign of Taurus, which is a sign where it's exalted. So he has an exalted moon here. It's in the Nakshatra of Kritika, which is an interesting one I'll hit on. And it is in the sixth house. Now, the sixth house represents debts, illness, legal issues, um, disease, problem solving. It's known as a house of service. This is where a lot of our karmas are, are enacted. This is where we burn off a lot of our karmas is in the sixth house, where we provide service to others. So when we see a, an exalted moon here in the sixth house, we're going to be able to see someone who wants to be of service to others, wants to help people. And if you actually go look at the businesses that he's founded, regardless of what you think of his presidential campaign or anything like that, his first business was a biotech company that was developing medicines that normally big pharma wouldn't touch. Um, you know, they wouldn't, there were certain diseases that they didn't really want to help with. So he wanted to develop those medicines. You know, people had a disease, they had a problem. He wanted to be able to figure out how to, to solve that. Uh, with Stripe, a financial company, he founded that as a way of being able to counter the effects of BlackRock and other really large um, NGO companies that are trying to push their influence into the world to influence people's opinions. He wanted to have a challenge to that. So then he, that helping in the financial industry, uh, going after um, studying the Constitution and law. That's so he could help figure out the legal issue. So there's... There's this theme repeated of service to others and, and being of service to people, being of service to society, helping people with their issues, whether that's a disease, a financial issue, you know, any type of thing, very much is a six house type of issue. Now, Kritika Nakshatra, this is where it gets really interesting. Kritika Nakshatra is one that bridges from the end of Aries into the beginning of Taurus. So it kind of has qualities of both it has the earthy energy and grounded energy of taurus but also some of that fiery energy of aries critica is symbolized by an axe or a blade and it is all about cutting things critica comes from the the, the sanskrit it's the root word for in sanskrit is crit which means to cut to um, to make into pieces right this is where critical comes from when you're critical of some critica people can be very critical and this is very much something we can see but it's not it's not in a harsh way you can see it's on the Taurus side of things so it comes off much more grounded he'll criticize things like questions reporters give him or whatever it may be 
but he'll he'll do it in a grounded way. It's not just an insulting, uh, pointless, shit talking type of thing. That there is very specific things that he'll point to and highlight, but do so kind of in a grounded, balanced way, and you know where the motivation behind it is to be of service. He'll he'll even he'll actually say that phrase a lot. I don't think we're doing anyone any favors, or uh, people deserve this. You know these type of phrases. That's that's a moon and Taurus in the sixth house type of thing. It, it's focused on being of service. The next one I want to hit on very quickly here, and I'm and I'm trying to just do a, a very brief introduction to this because there's a lot to hit on. You know, we could go look at Mahadasha, Mahadasha di, uh, cycles, uh, the D10 chart, transits coming up on election days, and I could make predictions and things. But I just want to lay a foundational interest in, in looking at his birth chart very quickly and and if this is something that is interesting you guys and you want to hear uh more of this let me know in the comments below and i i'm definitely happy to do more in-depth videos because uh i'll go ahead and personally say it vivek is a candidate i find very personally interesting uh, anyone who's familiar with my work is very much familiar with the fact that i'm an anarchist uh but in recent years like in more studying the constitution and stuff i can say i'm probably more stepping into uh, a minarchy type of position uh depending as so long as things are all done voluntarily because society has to organize themselves. And, you know, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but I've never seen a candidate before that actually caught my attention where I was like, yeah, that person's definitely an honest person. That person would make an effective leader. And Vivek is the first one that ever actually caught my attention. So then as I started digging into him and listening to him deeper, and then, you know, especially as, as an astrologer, then looking at his chart I, I can very much see this is a person that, that I at least find is actually worth uh, paying attention to. So again, laying some foundation. And if this is something you guys do want uh, more in-depth breakdowns of, I'm happy to do that. The next position I want to look at here is the Jupiter retrograde in, in the sign of Capricorn and the Nakshatra Shravana. Um, we hit on this a little bit earlier. Uh, Jupiter, it's also in the second house here. So Jupiter uh, in Capricorn normally isn't as happy there because that is where uh, it's in its enemy sign. It's in the sign of Saturn. Now, obviously, we want to see how Saturn is placed in the chart, and that's going to determine how well this Jupiter performs. And we'll, we'll actually see how it, it's very well placed here for, for in this combination. But Jupiter can definitely feel a little bit frustrated there. And the reason being is that Capricorn is ruled by Saturn, and the way Saturn works is it's it's a constricting, it's a pressure type of influence. Jupiter wants to expand things. So here Jupiter wants to expand, but feels restricted. And this is definitely where we can see a Jupiter retrograde coming up here. What does it do because it feels that restriction? It speaks out against it. It wants to understand why. It wants to seek out knowledge. And, and especially where it feels restricted is in the areas of uh, morality, values, long-term finance, those type of things, that uh, health. These are all issues that deal with the second house. So you can see here is that Jupiter and Capricorn, Capricorn's the side of the government. So this person could feel like the government is restricting them. So they're going to speak out against it. Okay. A Jupiter and Capricorn can also be an indication of someone that will actually eventually serve in government or something like that, but they're not going to be a typical politician. They're going to be someone who's very critical of the system. It's they're not. It's not going to be a. They're going to feel like the system is restrictive and they need to minimize it. They need to cut it down. They need to get rid of it. They need to get rid of restrict. Like he, that's even part of his policy plan is he wants to get rid of all the senseless restrictions. He wants to get rid of the ATF. He wants to get rid of the nuclear regulatory uh, agency. He wants to be able to drill and develop nuclear and burn coal and all these different things that are going to unrestrict the economy and allow it to grow financially. That 100% is a Jupiter retrograde in Capricorn in the second house. I mean, you could it's a perfect example of where that's coming from. Now, the nakshatra that this is in Shravana, Shravana nakshatra is all about listening, hearing others. And that's something a lot of people say is a very strong uh, gift of Vivex, is that he's a very good listener. If you watch him taking questions from people, 
these type of things. He he gives them his focus. He he looks at them. He really tries to take in and hear what they're saying. A lot of politicians just, you know, blow people off or, you know, whatever. Politicians normally don't give a fuck about people. Uh, but this man will actually take the time to genuinely listen to what someone is saying and give them a real answer, a straightforward answer and not dance around things. That's that's very much an indication of that Shravana and the Chakra right there. And we can also see that many of the things that he's speaking about, he's speaking about morals, values, the things we should care about, um, being proud of our ancestors, our heritage. That's all second house type of stuff. So the lessons that he's trying to bring to people, the way he's teaching, that the way he's leading as a man and as a leader, uh, um, those type of things, this, this Jupiter is how it's going to play out. So you know that that is that is a very I would say very well placed Jupiter, especially once we we peek in depth a little bit more here and and look at where Saturn is. Um, we do want to keep in mind too that Jupiter is the ruling planet of the whole chart, so it's ruling his first house and his fourth house, which for a president, those are two very big houses. Seeing that it's in Capricorn, like I'll, I'm just I'll say it out right now: if this man isn't president this time, and I think he will be. He, he will be in 2028 like for, for absolutely um this this guy definitely has karma in his chart to be a leader of a country and there's that not just from jupiter saying that that placement is a very strong indicator of it but they're really the whole chart when you look at it there's many many indicators of that the next thing i want to look at here is this saturn because saturn is the dispositor of capricorn here so it's dispositing jupiter well we see saturn is exalted so even though jupiter may be debilitated in capricorn technically I, i've said this many times before debilitated planets actually end up performing a lot better many times especially in the modern world and you you always have to look at how well are they going to perform you have to look at the dispositor well the dispositor is exalted saturn is in libra it's doing very well it's in the nakshatra of vashaka which i'll talk about and it's also worth noting we have uh, K2 and Pluto both here as well in Swati. And for those who don't know, this is obviously in his 11th house of gains and social network circle. So big conjunction here. Now, first off, let's talk about the sign of Libra. Obviously, it's about balance. It's about networking, marketing, making connections, all of these different types of things. You know, it's ruled by the planet Venus. So it's a very, very friendly type of sign, but it is the masculine or the external expression of Venus. It is an air sign. So it's very intellectual, very intelligent, good at communication. So these are all qualities we see of Libra. Now the 11th house also has many of these exact same qualities because it is originally the home of Aquarius, which is also an air sign. It's also the external expression of a planet, which that being Saturn highly intelligent deals with networking marketing gains so libra and aquarius have lots of syner uh, synergy between them so when you place libra in the 11th house there there is a, a strong synastry it does well there now saturn when it comes into vishaka nakshatra is is very good for having long-term strategy the reason being is Saturn is a very slow moving planet. It's one of the outer planets. So it's very slow moving in its cycle. It takes a long time. It's very disciplined. It's very hard working. It has long term goals and focus. The Shaka Nakshatra is a Nakshatra that is much like Purva Shada we spoke about earlier, is a very strategic Nakshatra. It is ruled by Lord Indragni. So Lord Indragni could actually be seen a couple ways as one deity. But also, you could also see it as two, it being the combination of Lord Indra, which is uh, the god of, he's the king of the gods, but he's a thunder god. So rain, water, that type of element. And Lord Agni, which is the lord of fire. Uh, if you go and actually study all the ancient texts, these are two of the most named deities. So that's just interesting to know. So Indragni is the nakshatra where these two opposing, what appear like opposing forces come together. So it, it has a few different symbols. One is a branch that comes together in like a Y-shaped branch. 
the point where they join, that's Vishaka. It's, it's about bringing opposites together. Another symbol for it is that of a victory arch. Now, a victory arch, for those of you who don't know, in ancient times, whenever a battle or a war was won, they would build a monument in an arch shape, and then they would depict images of the battle in that arch. They would parade through it, and kind of known as a victory arch. But it represents a theme of, and this is something you'll really see with Vishaka people, is that they see a goal, they want to go towards it, and they'll move towards it in a military-like fashion. They'll very strategically move towards their goal. They'll accomplish it, and then they walk through that arch, and then they're they're on to the next thing. So there, there's almost a, a feeling of never being satisfied, and that is a driving force for them as a person. Another thing Vishaka does is, as a Nikshakta, it, it, it wants to unite opposites to make things grow. So just like a farmer needs both the rain and the sunlight in order to make his crops produce, the Shaka Nikshakta needs to do the same thing. It brings and unites opposites together in order, what things that may seem completely different polarities of each other, it brings them together and unites them in order to accomplish a goal. And this is very much, you can see, I'd say some of somewhat reflected in the message that Vivek is saying, you know, he's, he's bringing people in like myself, for example, um, anarchist or libertarians, minarchist, all sorts of people who had never participated in the system before because it had been so corrupt, actually saying that, no, there, there is a way that we could actually move forward. There is a way we could fix this, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's something there's people that are traditionally, um, more independent or even Democrats that are, talking about voting for Vivek. So we, we can even see this in, in his messaging so the, of being able to unite different forces together in order to produce something and move move something forward. What is it that he's wanting to grow in the long term? Because like Saturn and Vishak, it's like I said, it's about long-term goals. Well, the long-term goal for him is being able to have our country be revived, to be able to move it forward, to grow. Like, you know, instead of looking at our country like it's de decaying, a lot of people said that we're an empire in decline. He's looking at nowhere young country. If you actually look at it historically and compares to many other countries in the world, we're very young. So maybe we're a country in our youth. We still have a long way to go. We need to look at ourselves and reflect and be strategic and move forward with our goals. You know, that type of message, that's where we see this coming from is the Saturn and Vishaka right here. Um, so it's a very, very interesting position to have. Now, having K2 and Pluto both here as well will show kind of a, not only a natural, uh, like a spiritual wisdom and inner knowing of things, but especially when we, when we look at the Nakshatra that these fall into, which is Swati. Swati Nakshatra I've spoken about many times before. It's a very unique Nakshatra. In fact, it's the star of individuality. It is one that is all about communication honesty uh they make great salesmen but they're the salesmen that they're not like your typical salesman they they will only try to market or sell something that they believe in they the way they feel like the best way to sell people on something is to explain all the options thoroughly so people can be completely informed and then make the best decision so you know say for example like i so for example i i have a uh some Swati uh, dispositions. My son and Mercury are in there. And I used to be a salesman and I'd sell like uh, flooring building materials. I worked at a Menards for a long time. If those of you who don't know what that is, it's like a giant hardware store. And I worked in a few different positions there, but one of the best ways I would always explain to people was they had what was called like good, better, best. So if someone was looking at flooring, I, I would explain, okay, so here's the, there's the good option, the better option, and then the best option. Here's the different price points, the different benefits, you know, et cetera, and just walk them through all of those options. That way they could make the best decision uh, based off of their, what they want and, you know, their budget. And then they try to find the balance point between that. And that was something I always noticed. People really appreciated that approach instead of you just trying to pick the most expensive thing and then shove it down their throat. No, actually, like, let them understand what they need to look at. And then they, when they're properly informed, they make the best decision. Like I say, um, a universal law I've always uh, I've discovered and, and always applies is awareness reveals choice. 
So, so that's very much a lesson you'll see with Swati Nikshatra. It's about creating awareness so then people have a choice. So that's why they end up making a, a good uh, salesman or a good lawyer or, you know, a negotiator, businessman, whatever it may be. They, they do it um, in an honest way and in a very unique way. They're very individualistic. They don't like being chained down. They're very uh, – trust is a really big thing for Swati people. You know, it's symbolized by uh, grass blowing in the wind. And if you actually look at grass, um, some heavy bushy grasses, they have very deep root systems. So there is a grounded element to them. Like they, they go very deep, they're grounded, but at the same time, they want the flexibility to blow in the wind. So it's really embodying what can seem like polar opposites. And again, again, this is also a, um, a reflection of the sign of Libra. Libra is all about that same thing of balancing the opposites uh, Vishakha Nakshatra has that same thing. You know, these, these are Nakshatras that are found in Libra and they have the same theme of the balancing of different polarities. The, these are why these are Nakshatras that are found in Libra. The other thing to mention about Swati is it is a Nakshatra that is made of an individual star. So there's only three Nakshatras that are like that. And that's going to be Swati, Chitra, and Ardra Nakshatra. So when you see one of these nakshatras or multiple of these nakshatras repeated like we do here with Swati and Ardra, you're going to see the person is very, very unique. It's also worth noting that Venus here that's in Ardra in the 7th house is also ruling Libra here, ruling the 11th house. So Venus is the one that's ruling this big conjunction here. So we can, we can very much see... Uh, his communication will always come back to, hey, let's let's stir up a storm, get through this cleansing period, and then we can we can see the sun on the other side. There, you see the combination. That these are how all these planets work and interact and dance together in a chart. That you'll see um, certain themes repeated, supported, uh, that type of thing, and that's how you can really tell what behavior a person's really going to exhibit is, you know, if you see something once in a chart, okay, yeah, that quality will be there. If you see it uh, three, four, five, six times where that same theme is repeated over and over again, the more it's repeated, the stronger that theme, the stronger that quality is going to be expressed in the person. Um, so that's, that's a way that when you look at a chart, you know, you look at these individually, but understand how they all dance and play together. The next thing we're going to look at here is this conjunction in his eighth house in the sign of cancer. Here we have uh, Sun, Mars, and Mercury, which interestingly enough, uh, so Mars is debilitated. Mercury isn't really the happiest in cancer, but it does excel in the eighth house. So Mercury's, you know, there and Sun isn't really happy in cancer. And in the eighth house, it's not the happiest it is because the eighth house is where the sun is beginning to set okay so you you would actually think that this could be a conjunction that would be read as something of like giving him some problems but i think when you actually look at his how it works you'll you'll see why it actually becomes a strength and and i think a great place to start that off with is this uh mars and pushing a chakra because sun and mercury are both in his alicia so we'll speak at we'll speak about those at, um together but let's cover this mars and push you first so mars when it comes into the sign of cancer the reason why it's it's like debilitated is because it's it's a soldier or a fighter being in the sign of the mother or the nurturer so it's it's kind of it's not it's not the place where the soldier feels comfortable you know they're meant to they're meant to be a fighter they're used to the conflict and the battle that's what feels normal to them the emotional nurturing and those type of things that can feel off. So there's kind of a disinistry between Mars and cancer. But as I said before, when a planet is debilitated, many times it actually ends up performing better. And I've actually spoken about Mars and cancer in many different examples of how that can actually make a person a lot more successful because it makes them a fighter in the sense that because Mars gets frustrated there and it's in an emotional sign like cancer, it, it can actually make them push back harder. It makes them fight harder. You'll actually see a lot of uh, fighters, boxers, these type of people 
um, people who are known for fighting lawyers, they can actually have a debilitated Mars and it makes them very, very effective at what they do because they just have, they just have that emotional charge and resolve behind whatever it is they're doing. And that just makes them push themselves that much harder than what other people are because, because that challenge is there, you know, um, our challenges are, are what our gifts are just wrapped up in. You know, many people just don't unwrap. They don't ever unwrap their gift because it's wrapped up in a challenge. Mars and cancer that would be a great example of that. Now, Pushya Nakshatra is a nakshatra. Again, uh, it's symbolized, it, it, it's very maternal. It's symbolized by a cow udder or a lotus flower, um, the udder being the more common one. So it's all about nurturing, giving and giving and giving without expecting anything in return. Like um, a cow doesn't do anything other than eat grass. It doesn't, you know, you can go milk it over and over again, and it's never going to charge you for that or anything. It just gives that nourishment or a mother um, that's nourishing her baby. She's not going to ask something back from them. She's just giving. So Pusha has this energy. So when you get Mars in Pusha, and especially in the eighth house, which is a house of transformation, destruction, revealing of secrets, you get a person who's going to want to fight to reveal things and to transform things. And whatever it is that they're trying to transform and trying to change, there's going to be an emotional driving force behind that of wanting to somehow nourish and help people. So you can you can see that in his businesses or in his campaign of that same that type of theme of wanting. I see issues here. We need to fight against this. We need to change it. We need to transform it. We need to expose the secrets. Um, that way people can be nourished from it. that type of theme. That's very much what you'll see here with this position. Now, when we have uh sun and mercury here it's worth noting that mercury is retrograde so again it will have that uh, that kind of same theme as jupiter retrograde where it will want to criticize things it'll it'll want to look at what people said review it and then kind of pick it apart that's one of the things it'll do but the nakshatra that this is in is, is leisha nakshatra and so leisha is one of the most misunderstood nakshatras and I'll actually say this now, this Nakshatra placement is probably one of the reasons why some people feel like, eh, I don't know if I can quite trust this guy. It's because Islisha is a Nakshatra that's very misunderstood. So Islisha is ruled by the Nagas. For those of you who don't know, these are like ser serpent beings and deities. They live deep underground in, Naga in Nagaloka. And they hold secret knowledge. They're mystics. Um, they they hold uh secrets of meditation spiritual knowledge they also like wealth riches lots of beauty they're artistic they're good with medicines these type of things uh is leisha is a nikshakra that you'll see people who are very good with medicines like weighing out dosages um these type of things weighing out dosages these type of things they'll be able to just kind of know what is needed when it comes to medicine. So you can see them combining things, mixing things. A lot of times they'll work in medical fields or, or fields such, such as that. They also make really good detectives, those type of people, because they're very good at finding out secrets. You know, and serpents in all sorts of different mythology have always been known for, for having secret knowledge because the serpent moves and lives and exists in a, in a way that's very different than other creatures. So they have a very unique and a, a different perspective compared to others. And this is something that we can see in Aslisha, that people with Aslisha will tend to have different perspectives than a lot of other people. They'll see the world in a unique way. They also slither and move forward like a snake. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying that if you look at how a snake has to move, it has to push off the ground. It has to slither. It has to push itself off its surroundings in order to move forward to, towards its goal. Well, in the same way, as Leisha people can do this, that they will move towards a goal. And whenever they accomplish that goal, they go through a, uh, a shedding of personality, so to speak, right? A snake has to shed its skin because it's growing. In order to grow, it has to let go of that old skin. So it takes, it takes forward with it what it needs to from the experience and then it lets the rest that it that is keeping it from going go. 
So as Lisha people will go through these phases of their life that much like a snake, they shed their skin. They go through different phases of growth where they'll shift their perspective a little bit. They'll nuance it. Um, they might move to uh, another um, another perspective on things. And they associate with people that they need to based off of the goals that they have. And it's not because they're using people. It's because that's what's relevant at the time. You know, if you have, say, for example, you uh, at one point in your life, you were really into surfing, right? You had a bunch of friends and associates that were into that. And then eventually you kind of go through another phrase and you decide, man, I kind of feel like moving up to the mountains. Okay. And then you have a different type of person that you associate with up there. It may be a while before you call that person that is, you know, living around wherever you were surfing or something, right? Because it, it's a different lifestyle. The, the communication is not necessarily the same because it's not relevant. So that doesn't mean these people don't uh, stop thinking about their friends or whatever it may be. They just are kind of very focused on moving forward. And they, they just focus on what's relevant. You know, they're pushing off of what's around them at the time. So that's one reason why Asalisha gets very misunderstood. And again, the, um, the growing and shifting and changing of perspective of, is something that some people don't understand. Because many, many people feel like you should remain with the exact same thoughts and perspectives your entire life. And you should never change them. And that's a, that's a very dogmatic way of thinking. If you're growing by definition, that means you are changing. So if you're not changing, you're not growing, you're stagnating. So this Lisha is an Akshakthara that is very growth focused. It's always wanting to move forward towards a goal. And like I said, they also have that, like a serpent, have a very unique view and perspective of the world. They'll also many times have like a sixth sense, like, like a different just a different sense of knowledge going on. You think about a serpent, like when they detect, you know, they detect the faintest sense of their surroundings, you know, or when they view, they can see heat signatures. You know, they, they view things in a way, they sense things in a way that other animals don't. So they have a different perspective. They have knowledge from of like a secret, kind of a secret perspective, so to, so to speak, or sixth sense is a really good way to explain it. So they'll see things coming ahead of times. They'll sense things coming ahead of times. They tend to have very strong intuitions as Alicia Nakshatra people. So that's something that we'll see. And being that it's Sun and Mercury here, this is going to have a, a very strong influence on who he is as a person. And Mercury does excellent in the 8th house. It's one of the only planets that will actually perform very well in the 8th house because it's curious and the 8th house is about secrets. So Mercury wants to investigate here. A person becomes a detective when Mercury moves into the eighth. You know, that that type of very curious type of personality. You can't tell them, hey, I know a secret, and then not tell them what it is because they're going to find out. It's, it'll drive them nuts until you tell them. That's the type of energy you'll see here when Mercury comes into the eighth. And especially when you get Islishan Nakshatra in the eighth, it's a Nakshatra that is all about learning secrets, having secret knowledge. You put it in the eighth house of secrets, and it's really, really good at revealing things it's really good at seeing what people's true intentions are you know with uh former president trump i think one of his downfalls you know and you know whatever you think of him this this is just an, an honest criticism i think one of his downfalls was not being able to properly vet and pick people i think there are a lot of people that he actually let close to him that didn't have uh, his best intentions in mind, you know, his VP, Mike Pence being one that ended up completely turning on him, or, you know, he appointed someone like Nikki Haley to a cabinet position, you know, so that judge of character, not there so much in that case. And, and I can look at Trump's chart and break it down sometime too, and actually explain why that is and why he has that. That's a weakness of his, but with Vivek, it is the opposite of that. He has a, this is Leisha in the eighth, especially with like a Mercury and a sun, uh, Mars there, it's going to make him very, very keen on being able to detect lies, um, see other people's strategies, see how other people are moving, and to be able to to be multiple steps ahead of that. And And we see that repeated over and over again, where the media will try to corner him with something, and then he just completely, he knows where they're coming from, he gets to the root of it, he, he flips it on them, destroys their narrative, 
and people really like it, even if they don't plan on voting for him. If you go read comments on X or things like that, you'll see people, even if they're Trump fans or whatever, they're like, man, I love the way he handles reporters. Like he just, he beautifully destroys them and demolishes them, but in an eloquent, articulate way. That's absolutely the type of thing we see with these positions like a Mercury and a Silesia or a Purva Shada Lagna or, you know, Saturn and Vishaka, these Swati placements, Moon and Kritika, all, all very much placements that very much allow him to be a person that can, in an articulate and eloquent way, go and destroy things, mostly mainstream narratives and, uh, and the narratives of the system. So we can see here, you know, why he's a very interesting candidate. Now, he also has, you know, there's some other things to look at. We could look at um, Rahu and Barini Nikshakra here in the sign of Aries. This is an interesting one to note. It's worth noting, too, Vivek just got finished with a Rahu K2 return uh, back in October. So he was going through Rahu and K2 return there for uh, 18 months previous to that. Now... Rahu and Aries is going to make a person where they have big desires, big goals, and they're willing, they want to take action on them. But instead of just rushing quickly without like jumping without looking like a lot of Aries energy can kind of do, Barini Nakshakler makes this interesting. Barini is symbolized by a pregnant elephant. And if you look at the gestation period of an elephant, it has one of the longest gestation periods of any animal. Whenever that baby is born, it, it can stand up relatively quickly and it's a pretty, it's a good, it's an elephant. It's a good size animal. It's ready to roll. Um, Barini has this same theme that they'll have goals that they want to achieve, but when they're planning, it's kind of like the stage where there's a pregnancy and then whenever, and that pregnancy can last for a while, but whenever they, whenever the moment comes for it to implement that plan, that plan is off and running. And this is very much something you can see in, some of the things he's saying politically, his plan for shutting down the um, the government, getting rid of the FBI, um, you know, all the different things he plans on doing. You can tell he's been researching this for a while. Like this is not something he just thought about. This this man probably had a feeling or knew from a very young age that he wanted to be um, president or he, or he had a dharmic or karmic responsibility to do so. And for a long time has been very strategically planning and thinking and watching observing things figuring out okay where are the problems how do we resolve those and then more important move forward after resolving those so that's what i'm talking about these these plans they've taken a while to form but whenever they're implemented they're as soon as they're implemented be able to move forward just like elephant that it hits the ground and it's ready to start walking that's going to be the type of effect that you see when these things are implemented. And it's worth noting this is in the fifth house of education as well. So you get a Rahu and Aries in the fifth. You're going to get a person who's very, very interested in education. Anything they want to learn, anything anything they have a desire to learn, they will find a way to learn. They'll be a very curious person, very fiery, um, and they, they're not going to be a small-minded person. They're not going to have small goals. They're going to have very big goals that's they're not you know it's not going to be uh just some little thing they want to accomplish they want to change the world that's very much you can see that with a rahu and aries type of thing and then his bingo brindu here i'll quickly hit on this um the bingo brindu is is the destiny point um it is also in kritika nikshakra here um and on the aries side of things so he has a uh a destiny in this life a karma to to do something with having the education or the knowledge to be able to cut things that need cut. And it's going to be a, some sort of a fight because it's in the sign of Aries. So just as a quick note on that, and I can break, break that down and maybe his Aruta Logner down more in depth next time, but this is kind of getting about to the, uh, the time, you know, I want to try to keep this around an hour or so, but like I said, short view, a lot of very interesting things going on in this chart. I, I could look at this, more and more in depth for sure and if that's something you guys want to see let me know in the comments below if this is something you've enjoyed um i will also probably do another breakdown of his d10 chart at some point the dashamsha because the dashamsha is known as a chart of great success but it's also a people look at it as for a chart for career and analyzing career and it, that is a great way to use it but really what it is 
is the chart of your service to the world, your service to society. And there's certain things that when you see them in the D10 really stand out that will show that a person, what kind of service to society they're supposed to perform. Uh, as a quick note, seeing Saturn in the Logna in the D10, so and doesn't matter what sign it's in, if you, if you go and look at your D10 chart or anybody else's D10 chart and you see Saturn in the first house, one of the things that it means is that that person is supposed to be of service to others. They, they're supposed to be a servant to humanity because Saturn is a servant. So you when you bring that into the first house of the D10, uh, sorry, when you bring that into the first house of the D10, it makes it to where that person, they have a karmic destiny. They have a, a dharma they need to fulfill of being of service to others, being of service to the greater world of something bigger than themselves. So that is something very interesting to know. And, um, you know, I will definitely do a in-depth breakdown of his D10 chart at some point here. But I hope you guys found this interesting. Like I said, I found Vivek to be a very, very interesting candidate. And I'm, I am not one to just put my support behind any politician. I've never put my support behind any politician before. Um, but after listening to what this man has said and doing the research on him and then, you know, as, as a Jyotishi, then going and looking at his chart and seeing the karmas that are laid out here, th this is a person that I think can very much help and, and bring the needed change into our country and our world. Like really set an example and make America to where it can be a country that other people can look up to again um, and not just this corrupt cesspool that, it, that it's become with you know the modern system being in charge because that that's not representative of the average person in the united states i don't think you know uh, i think the whole world knows that what the american citizens want and what the united states government want are two very different things and i think this person has the karmic dispositions and the ability to be able to go in and to in a proper way with a plan destroy what needs to be destroyed reform reform things and to be able to move forward so and that you know that last little bit that's just my personal interpretation of things if you found it valuable let me know in the comments thank you for tuning in and i look forward to seeing you guys next time